here. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, so uh, I bless the Most High for this week, and um, you know this lesson is really a, a, a lesson that, as you'll see, speaks to will speak to all of our heart. The title of the lesson, I believe, the title of the lesson is Eternal Life, um, and and so you know. What kind of thoughts do you have when you see that, that title? I'm sure you know, people's minds are racing and, and, and saying this and that and the other, and some of you are right where I'm at, and some of you got some additional stuff, and uh, the ones that are offline, I, you know, I wish you can feel free to share what thoughts and questions you might have as we go on, because you know, this is interactive. I mean, the, the, the internet has made this uh, available to us. And, hey, let's talk for a second about internet ministry, right? So um, just so everybody knows, I prefer personal, in touch, looking in the people's faces ministries. But, you know, it's 2021, right? Is it 2022? See how far behind the times I am? So it's 2022, and the way things work now is that people are uh, often remote from the ministries that they pick to, to listen to. And so we have to do what we have to do in order to keep the word out, to keep the people encouraged, to keep the people understanding the truth of the kingdom. Hallelujah. So here we are, and I'm going to just go ahead and open in prayer and get started. Baruch atah Yahuwah, blessed be your set-apart name. Torah Abba, for you are Baola, up high and looking down low. Not to, not to just be harsh on us, not to overjudge us, Abba, but to correct us, to put us on the path that's straight, Abba, and we appreciate you for that. We, we ask that you would just be in our midst, Abba, for those that are listening now, for those who will be listening later, that you would speak to their hearts, Abba, that you would find a way, Abba, in your miraculous ability to use the voice, the tongue, the mouth of Ephraim in order to speak something that thus says the Yahuwah unto your people. And we ask, Abba, that you would not only just send it, but that you would it to us that we would be bound to your word, that we would find ourselves walking in your word, and, 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 and that your anointing would begin to continue to break your bondage for our lives, that we would find ourselves more and more, and more conformed to the image of your dear Sahusha Mashiach. Hallelujah and Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. All right. So let's, uh, let's just get started. So... Um, yeah, I know my favorite, one of my favorite pictures, but I changed the title when I was on the alarm. Uh, so I'm going to start off kind of strange, right? It's like, I love flowers, right? So these flowers are called astromelias. I think they're called, my, my Ima introduced me to them many years ago, and, and they are just beautiful to me. I just love them. Um, but I realize that their beauty is fleeting. Uh, e even, even the flowers that come back every now and again, are bound to die again and repeat their cycle of life. We've got the same propensities. In other words, we, we, we're in the same kind of boat. And this message is going to try, no, it's not going to try. It's going to illuminate th some of that for us and get us to recognize. One of the challenges that, that I find have found in my walk is agreeing with Elohim. And, and what do I mean by that? I have found that Elohim is truth and that he is right and he is good and he knows what is. And our challenge is to fall into agreement with that. You know, if all of the debates and the issues that we find ourselves in in terms of, you know, is there really an Elohim and, you know, what side of the, uh, the uh, how long is a day and all these kinds of things, he already knows it. And whether or not we're in him or not in him, he already knows it. And so the key to, to, to the shalom that I believe he's offering us is for us to find agreement with him. And, 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 and it's no wonder that there's so many confusing doctrines and lessons and teachings and et cetera, and so many facets that the people overemphasize in order to, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. I don't think it's on purpose. But those different facets tend to make us think that we don't have an understanding or that the reality is unclear to us. 
I want to take a facet of our lives today, and I'm going to bring some clarity to it so that we can um, at least have shalom there and just build shalom upon shalom. Amen. All right. So we, we go through the cycle of life uh, as if that's all to it. In other words, we live our lives a lot of the times as natural people. And, 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 and that's okay in some sense, but there's something more. And, and we often do this alone is what I'm saying. And so, you know, friends and spouses cannot, often cannot tap into the deep. You know what I mean by that? I mean that you, you've got stuff in your life, in your heart, things that you think about, things that you meditate on, things that you ask Elohim to help with that you don't feel comfortable sharing with anyone. And if you feel sh- comfortable sharing with, it, with someone, you are blessed because the nature of the stuff that goes inside your head, inside of my head, sometimes will confuse, confound, discourage other people because they would he- hear what you're saying and they would say, you know, I thought you were sane and you're obviously crazy. A man, can, it, can anybody bear witness to what I'm saying? So I see somebody laughing in the audience who, who, who obviously knows what I'm talking about. But, but, but you're not crazy and you're not insane. And the truth of the matter is, is that the same stuff that you're judging other people would think is crazy and insane, they've got the same thoughts in their head. They've got their version of those thoughts in their head. And, and the way the world and the way that the, 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 the systems of the world have things set up is that you keep that to yourself and therefore, I say, we often do it alone, and we don't have to be alone. One of the, one of the worst and depressing, most depressing feelings that most people have is being all by yourself. Think about it for a minute. And then consider how much of our lives war against that. Because if that's, if that's an enemy, then we need to war against it. And this is where the ideas of, of, of oneness and covenant and community come into play. And this is no wonder that oneness and community and covenant is, 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 is beat down. People are covenant breakers. People are, don't have any sort of uh, 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 inclusion or, or adhesion to each other that's, that's real. Everything is fleeting. Because somewhere inside of ourselves, we've been convinced we, we have to do it alone. And so that's what the, the, these, these comments are about. But, you know, let's go on to the next paragraph. So few of us have a deep appreciation of Yahuwah. I should have said such a deep appreciation of Yahuwah that gives us the fellowship required to stay in him. See, because even when my Isha don't understand me, even when my friends don't understand me, guess what? There's someone who completely, even better than I do, understands me. We call him Yahuwah, Elohim of Israel, the one who made the heavens and the earth. He knows you. He knows where you're at. He knows where you're going. He knows the struggles that you have inside and outside. And not only that, he's able to help us through. He's able to give us these paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that leads us, Abba, hallelujah, that leads us to those shalom that we all so deeply seek. So, so few of us have a deep appreciation of that uh, uh, that gives us the fellowship required to stay in him. And what I mean by that is, and I keep saying this, so I hope y'all are reading some of the things I suggest to read. Yohanan 17, read it. It is so beautiful what Mashiach is saying regarding us and him and the Father it is such a awesome, awesome, awesome interplay that he laid out in those chat in that chapter that really makes the, the the difference to me because I start to not believe the lie that I'm on my own. And that blesses me tremendously. I pray it'll bless you as well. So we we go in and out. We we we're like, you know, it's Shabbat, you know, hey Yahoo, it's Shabbat. And then on the other six days, it's like Hey world, it's it's or Monday through Friday or whatever Friday. So 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 I'm not gonna tell you what you need to do. 
But I'm going to tell you, it will really bless you to be in Yahuwah all the time, to be in agreement with him all the time, to be sleeping in agreement with him, to be waking in agreement with him. And though he's delivered us from one thing or another, I should have said, because probably he's delivered everybody listening to this from something. And if he hasn't, he will. And when he does, and after he has, what we tend to do is drift until we need him to deliver us from something else. And this is that, this is that roller coaster walk that, that so many of us are going on this you know, mountaintop to, to valley experiences instead of that steady state, that steady state that we're going to get to in a little bit later. All right. So I thought I'd throw in just a little bit of Hebrew. Chai nes chai, or eternal life. Uh, as often happens, this message was preached to me first. <laughs> so if it stings anywhere, if it makes you think, man, I frame all hard on me or anything like that, I want you to know that, that, that I heard it first. So it will also bless you in that we have similar journeys. The names change, but none of us are completely innocent regarding this stuff. All right, let's keep it moving. So in Jacob, or the book of James, it says in chapter 4, verse 13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, let us go to such and such city, spend a year there and trade and make profit, when you do not know of tomorrow. What did Mashiach say about tomorrow? He says, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow's got enough trouble of its own. We need to... We need to have this balance where we're able to live in today and to see that we're like here now as opposed to the drift that we often feel about tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And, you know, as, 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 as we get older, oftentimes, you know, maybe we're thinking about retirement, we're thinking about grandchildren, we're thinking about all of these things that are coming to mind, whether we will have children, and, 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 and every one of these things is something that has some value for concern, but that also have this potential to draw our concern away from right now. And I'm going to tell you, tomorrow is not necessarily promised. We all know that. Yesterday is already gone. All you have is right now. All right, so Jacob goes on further to say, for, for, for what is your life? And you see, I underline it because, because I underlined it and darkened it or bolded it, made it bold. The reason I did that, I'll tell you in a minute. For it is a vapor that appears for a little and then disappears. Instead of you're saying, if the master desires, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your proud speeches. All such boasting is wicked. To him then who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so what does he mean all this boasting is wicked? And so is it, oh, is it bad for me to say, well, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and I'm going to make pancakes? I don't think that's what he's saying. I think... I think what he's saying, what he's, what he's trying to impart the readers of this uh, uh, letter to is that nothing you can't, you can't do anything if Elohim doesn't allow it. See, see, it's a really a slippery slope because, you know, I've got some abilities. I've got the strength in myself to pick up this here and put it back down. And I've got the strength to stand up and walk outside. And I've got the strength to, to do all manner of things. And so it, it, could, it could seem as though I'm my own man. It could seem as though you're your own man or you're your own woman. And even though we know deep inside that, that our life is like a vapor, it's just here and then it's gone. It's like a hand breath. It's like, it's like poof. And yet we emphasize it to such a degree to where Jacob was led to say, hey, it's just a vapor. And don't you be going around letting yourself think 
that you're running anything in an inordinate fashion. What do I mean? Don't let yourself think that you're the man, you're the woman, you're the girl, you're the whatever that's able to do whatever it is that you want and whenever you want because you're the master of your own destiny. Well, you know, you may have some interplay to your own destiny, but there's only one sovereign. And that sovereign, if we can keep it in our heart, will actually lead and guide us to truth, lead and guide us to prosperity according to his will, lead and guide us in so many ways that once you've tried it, you really don't want to do without it. All right, let's go on. It can be difficult not to get caught up in the care of this life. <laughs> so, so, so I thought about that after I wrote, oh, no, no, for, sorry, let's go back. It's something I, I forgot to say. For what is your life, right? What is your life? That's the part that I bolded and then the other part I underlined. So, so what is your life? Think about it for a minute. You know, no, no, don't have to give me any answers. What, what is your life? Okay, after I let you think about it for a second, I'm going to just say, your life and this possession that you have on it is what the contrast that I got as I read this. And I've read this so many times, but this time when I read it, I said, what is your life? And I remember some things about life, about Chaim, about the, 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 the idea of everlasting life and the fact that we want everlasting life and on our own, we don't get it. So, so, so what am I saying? What I'm saying is that we don't just need our life. We need his life. Can I just make it plain? We need his life. So that's what that was about. So it can be so easy to get caught up or it is uh, difficult not to get caught up in the cares of life. You know, anybody who's grown, anybody who's not grown, anybody who's got children, anybody who's got business, anybody who's got work, anybody who's got uh, 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 needs and rents to pay and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it could be so easy to get caught up in the cycle of life. And there's this place for life. But let's see if the Most High can help us see how to put this thing in perspective. I go on further to say you can strive for things that have no eternal value. Anybody ever been guilty of that? I, I certainly have. You know, I, 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 I'm wanting something and that something is really doesn't have any value other than me getting some temporary satisfaction. E even the blessings of obedience to HaTorah are, are carnal. In other words, they're short-lived. They're, they're, not, they're not eternal. The, though, the key so let, let's take a quick look at some of them. Excuse me, let me turn something off. All right. So everybody's familiar with Deborah 28, and lots of people like to talk about the curses. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to talk about the blessings today. Hallelujah. <laughs> in Deborah or Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, and if you can see it on the screen, I want to get your book uh, it's all good. I'm going to read from the scriptures version. And it shall be, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahuwah Elohim, to God to do all his commands which I command you today, that Yahuwah Elohim shall set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yahuwah Elohim. Blessed are you in this city. Blessed are you in the field. Blessed is the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your livestock, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed in your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed are you when you come in and blessed are you when you go out. Yahuwah causes your enemies who rise against you to be smitten before your face. They come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yahuwah commands the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all 
to which you set your hand and shall bless you in the land which Jehoiakim has given you. Already, it's like overwhelmed, man. I, I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed going out. I got all of these blessings. And, you know, what I want us to think about while I'm reading through this is who doesn't want these blessings? All right, y- y'all can chime in later here or you can chime in on, on, the, on the chat and tell me who don't want these blessings. Anybody who doesn't want these blessings, I want to hear from you. All right, so let's go on. Verse number nine says, Yahuwah shall establish you as a set apart people to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you guard the commands of Yahuwah Elohim and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of Yahuwah is called upon you, and they shall be afraid of you. And Yahuwah shall make you to have plenty of what is good. In the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, in the fruit of your ground, in the land which Yahuwah swore to your fathers to give you. Yahuwah opens to you his good treasure, hallelujah, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you do not borrow. Anybody in debt out there? And Yahuwah shall make you the head and not the tail and you shall be only on top and not be beneath if you obey the commands of Yahuwah Elohim which I command you today to guard to do and do not turn aside from any of the words which I am commanding you today right or left to go after other mighty ones to serve them all right so that's a lot And so, Ephraim, why do you read that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. The reason I read that is because the commands themselves, I think I said in the verse in the the stuff before that they're carnal, but but the, the commands themselves, if we don't get this get this right, can actually be our target and our goal and the things that we want. In other words, we can lust after all of this. We could desire all of this. And if you're not careful, you can do that as though it's your mighty one, as though it's your idol, as though it's the thing that you've got to have. And this is the mistake that we all have made before. So let's fake it, face it. Nobody wakes up and prays. L- let me find a worse shelter for me and my family. Amen. I'm looking forward to buying a raggedy car next year. That should be traded for the better one. Pay, trade the better one I have for the raggedy one. Nobody's saying this. Wouldn't it be nice if my children were more rebellious? Nobody's saying that. Nobody prays. If only food and water was more difficult to obtain, then I would be satisfied. What a delight it would be if I was chased out of my own neighborhood because of my skin color or any other reason. So the reason I chose that one is because I had this dream, and that's a kolam that's at the bottom there. I was ordering this spinach sandwich and a cheeseburger, and uh, it was kind of an open, open diner place that uh, I discovered in the neighborhood that I was in in this dream. And I had gone up to the, to the counter, and I looked at the menu, and I was... Uh, Thinking of what am I going to order? So he's like, oh, a spinach sandwich. I asked for some special stuff in there, some onions and whatever, and make this sandwich go. And he says, I'll take a cheeseburger. And I hope it probably was a veggie burger, knowing me because I don't eat. But nonetheless, I ordered the food, and they were in the back the kitchen cooking it. And these two cats, you know, walked up on me. And, and, they, and they were kind of crowding me. And they were like, what are you doing around here? And I was like, well, what do you mean what I'm doing around here? Even though I know what they meant. What, what, what they meant was that I wasn't the right kind of guy. In this case, it was skin color. I wasn't the right kind of guy to be living in this neighborhood ordering myself a spinach sandwich. And so they were saying, you know, come with us. And they were trying to kind of strong arm me. And I was resisting it. And I was like, no, I, I'm not going with you. I don't want to go with you. And so, so, so I won't go on with the dream. But, but the point of this last bullet was, who wants that to happen to them? Who wants to have 
people always against you. Whether, whether, and it's not about a black thing, white thing, or whatever, because you could have been white in a black neighborhood and had the same kind of or similar kind of experiences. This is not about that. This is about the fact that everybody wants good to happen to them. Everybody wants to be blessed. Amen? Everybody wants to be uh, favored and, and not to be ill-treated. Everybody wants that. I guess, you know, there's some strange sicknesses out there where people might like pain, but that's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to us who want to follow Mashiach and want to live for Yahuwah, and every last one of us want to be blessed. So we want our own version of Deborah 28, uh, um, 1 through 14, and most of us are willing hard to get it uh, by the sweat of our brow. And when I, I wrote that little comment there, because I remember what happened in the garden and how the Most High spoke to, to uh, um, Adam and told him that, you know, he would bring forth um, the fruit of the ground by the sweat of his brow. And, you know, that sounds like a curse. So, so, so hold up. So you're saying that, you know, me working out in my field and bringing forth fruit and stuff is a curse I frame? Not exactly. What I'm saying is that this was a punishment and a curse for the disobedience that he, he did towards Yahuwah his Elohim. And I believe, I really believe in my heart that Messiah Husha has delivered us from all of the curses if we can hear it. So does that mean that I don't work? No, it doesn't mean that you don't work. But it means that, that, that your work can actually be pleasure. Your work can actually be uh, a delight and not like somebody's got a knife to your throat and not that you're like toiling and toiling and toiling in order to get almost nowhere. That's not the blessing of Elohim. That's a curse. And so, you know, I, I want us to meditate on that because, because even if the Most High gave you your work, even if he gave us the fields to work in, or whatever flavor they are, we have to be mindful that if we do that only according to our flesh, that it will become more like a curse and, a, and, and not a blessing. And so I want to emphasize that. I guess that's the promise that I'm going to start to put in perspective here with the next slide. So Yahusha made yet another statement in chapter 10. I'll read that in a second. W one that's often glossed over, right? And so that abundance of life is, is something that we see in the King James Version. Um, the Scriptures Version doesn't call it uh, abundance of life, but we're going to read it in the Scriptures Version, and we're going to remember how it's stated in the, um, in the, uh, um, the KJV, just because a lot of people are more familiar with that. All right, so I'm going to go to Yohanan or the book of John, verse, um, chapter 10, verse 7, and... I pray y'all would get your word out and, and follow along with me. So Yohanan 10 and 7. Whoops. All right. So Mashiach has just made this statement to uh, his, his Talmudin. And, um, hey, you know, y'all know how much I, I, I hate starting somewhere. So I'm going to start at verse 1 and just read fast until I get where I'm going. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the door into, uh, into the sheepfold but climbs up by another way, that one is a thief and a robber. But he who enters through the door is the shepherd of the sheep, and the doorkeeper opens for him, and the sheep hear his voice. So do you remember when we were reading Deborah four, uh, uh, 28? 1 through 14, how he kept saying, obey my voice, obey my voice, obey my voice. And so there's something about hearing the voice of Elohim that requires a level of intimacy. And this is really the crux of where I'm headed in this whole lesson. So I'm just going to throw a spoiler alert out right now. You're not hearing Elohim if you're not close to him. 
if he's yelling at you, it's probably because he's disappointed. But when he gives us direction, when he, when he calls us forward into something that's his delight, it's oftentimes a soft voice. It's oftentimes a subtle thing. And, and so just like it was in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, Mashiach s- makes this statement about the sheep hearing the voice. And he calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4 says, and when he has brought out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. So what is it about the shepherd being out in front of the sheep? That's their protection. And so, and so, I mean, I didn't even mean to go through all of this, but I can't help but break it down just a little bit. So that's our protection. When Yahuwah goes in front of us, that's our protection. When he's leading and guiding us, then our enemies don't have a chance because they've got to get through him first. But, but the key here is, is, is us being bound to him and being intimate with him. And when he's brought out his sheep, his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice and they shall by no means follow a stranger, but shall flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. And I just want to say that the enemy has this way of being uh, playing a ventriloquism trick on the set apart ones. What do I mean by that? He, 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 you know, it used to be popular. I don't see it that much, maybe because I'm not in those circles, but it used to be popular to um, mimic people's voices. Like people sound like President Nixon, showing my age, right? People sound like the President Nixon, make their voice sound like him, and et cetera, et cetera. And this, this trick, whatever they call it, because that's not ventriloquism whatever they call it. This is something the enemy is pretty good at. He wants to try to make you believe that you're following Elohim and you're not following Elohim. He wants you to be distracted in the sense that he can keep us from getting that 100% agreement that I talked about earlier with the Most High. So verse 6 says, Yahusha used this figure of speech, but they didn't know what he was saying to them. And verse 7 says, Yahushua therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me as thieves robbers, the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and shall find pasture. So I, I found this very curious that he says two things in this one sentence. He says they'll be saved. He'll be, they'll be saved. They're saved from what? Saved from what? Every time I see this word salvation or Yeshua, every time I see it in the scriptures, the first thing I think about, and I'll give you my version so that the Most High may give you your version if my version doesn't work for you, but I think about the deliverance out of Mitzrayim. See, because Israel was, was saved from Mitzrayim when they came out. They had been delivered from Mitzrayim. But that doesn't mean that they made it into the land. And so listen to what he says now with that in mind. He says, whoever enters in through me, he shall be saved and shall go in. He shall go out and find pasture. And so he, I, I'm seeing this picture where when we left Mitzrayim, we, 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 we were delivered out of there to be delivered into some place. And that some place was the land of promise. That, that some place was Canaan. That some place became Israel. In the book of Hebrews, it says really clearly that if that was the end of it, then it wouldn't yet be a promise before us. And so that was a stair step. That was a shadow picture. But the, the reality is, is that we're invited into the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. We're invited into the kingdom of heaven. And this is the ultimate goal. And what I'm here to tell you today is that you have access to that goal now. See, see, we're, remember that passage in, in, in Tehillim, um, or maybe Mashiach said it, that, that you will die like men. And I always wonder, why did he say that? Because everybody knows they're going to die like men. But the, when he said it, the emphasis was that 
you're going to die like men as though there was an alternative. <laughs> I don't know if y'all ever caught that when you read that passage. But the alternative is that we walk like sons and daughters of Elohim, and therefore the dying like men is almost of no impact because we've already been walking in the kingdom. We've already been walking in eternity. We're already walking in fellowship with the Most High. The light that we see is comfortable and it helps us, but we already have the light of Elohim in our lives. And this is so important because we're all, many of us are waiting for that transition. And I don't mean, boy, I'd be glad when it happens. But many of us are living our lives as though the transition has not occurred. But I'm here to tell you that suddenly the kingdom of heaven is upon you. I'm here to tell you that right now, hallelujah, we're in eternal life. I'm here to tell you that this is the key to what Mashiach is talking about as we go further on in, in Yohanan chapter 10. So let's get back to it. He says in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to slaughter, and destroy. The King James Version is so famous in, in my memory. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. Any trick he can use to do that is fair game. Even the world's got that proverb. What is it? All's fair and love and war, right? So, so that means that, you know, if you, if you love that girl, then you could do anything to get her. You know, if you're at war, you could do anything to your enemies. Heck with the Geneva Convention. Do what you got to do. This is war. This is how the enemy operates. By any means necessary to distract us from that high calling that we've been called to so that we don't work to make our election sure so that we get off trail just enough. So it says in verse number 10, I guess I was not finished with it, I have come that they might possess life. How do you say this to people who hear you? Because <laughs> dead people can't hear you. Does anybody see what I'm, I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to articulate and clarify this, this distinction that's obviously Mashiach is making. He's talking to people who can hear him. These people are to them. I have come that they might possess life. Well, they're already alive. So what is he talking about? He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about spirit-filled life. He's talking about that life that's got no boundaries set by your natural life. It doesn't have age, it doesn't have color, it doesn't, it's not rich, it's not poor, it doesn't have any of that. So he goes on to say that they might possess it beyond measure. And this is where the King James Version says, uh, like more, let me, let me, let me read it back to what it says. So I don't know if we have any technical difficulties out there. It froze. Hallelujah. 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 All right. So, so remember what I said about the devil... <laughs> He would do anything he could. And, and just as I'm sort of articulating this, and we had technical difficulties. I don't know what was missed, but here's the deal. The thief come but not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm come, this is Yahusha HaMashiach talking, that I, they might have life and that they may ha might have it more abundantly. I, they might have life and that they may ha might have it more abundantly. So let's look at this word uh, uh, abundant. And then we're going to go back to read. So let's look at this word uh, 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 abundant. And then we're going to go back to read a little bit more out of uh, Yohanan. So the Thayer's definition uh, says it's an adjective and it's exceeding some number, some measure, or rank. In other words, it's, it's a higher above, over, above, more than is necessary. Super added. What kind of word is this? Exceeding, abundantly, supremely, supremely. I like that one. Something further. Something more than regular life. 
See, we're clinging to life, and Mashiach is offering us something more than regular life. More, much more than all, more plainly. The reason I like that one as well is because there's no pollution you can put on eternal life. In other words, the essence of it is what it is. It's not colored by whether or not you have this, that, or the other. Because once you've got it, you're satisfied. You've got everything you need. And this is the problem with that roller coaster I was talking about earlier. Somehow, we, we, we grab hold of eternal life, we, we fall into agreement with the Most High, and, we, and, we, and we, we were walking this thing out, and then as we're walking, these mirages and illusions and all manner of things in this cycle of life start to say to us, look at me, look at me, I can make your life better. And we have to say, it's impossible to make my life better. And so I'm hearing some people say, but Ephraim, we got to eat. But Ephraim, we got to, and maybe it's me, you know, I'm saying, but I got to eat. I got to pay the mortgage. I got to do all of these other things. And yeah, 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 you're right. But here's the deal. Deborahim 28, 1 through 14, and even 15 through 60, whatever it is, I think like 68, these passages as clear as they seem to be about blessings and curses are really about being an Elohim or not being an Elohim. About depending upon Elohim or not depending upon Elohim. The, 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 the blessings and the curses are, 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 are secondary. It's, 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 not like, it's not like, man, I got to get my blessing and you work real, 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 real hard to do it. That's not the way the Most High designed it. He's saying, get me, get eternal life, walk in eternal life. And when you walk internal, into in eternal life, then I will bless you with all of these spiritual blessings. Not because it's a reward in the sense of some sort of transaction. Does anybody understand what I mean when I say Elohim is not making a transaction with us when we get blessed? He blesses us oftentimes when we don't deserve it. Amen? He, 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 he is... He is not like just doing some cashier's thing where you have some change and it's like, well, you know, Abba, I did this and I did that and I did that and now you owe me this. And that. He's not, it's not like that. Eternal life is, is an existence thing. 1B says superiority, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon, preeminence. In other words, there's nothing like it. Superiority, advantage, more eminent, more remarkable, more excellent. And I could go on and on and on with my own adjectives, but the point I think is clear that the Mashiach is telling us what he has for us is abundant life. And we have thought abundant life means what we see out there in Hollywood, what we see, you know, thieves and crooks and robbers and drug dealers get, fancy cars and this, that, and the other. We think that that's abundant life in a way that makes us chase after that instead of chasing after him. And I want to reset my life, and I hope that you can reset your life to chase after him and not chase after that stuff. Because when we begin to chase after him with our whole heart, the stuff chases after us. And we don't believe it, and that causes us to chase after stuff. All right. I said I was going to read a little bit more out of Yohanan, so let's do that. I think we're at verse number 11. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Remember I talked about your life in the slide earlier? Well, he's saying he's laying down his life. And, but the hireling is not, and not being a shepherd one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. So, you know, all of you all who are, uh, I guess everybody grew up in some kind of family, uh, even if it was a foster family or, or, or whatever. But whoever was supposed to be the leader of the family, let's just make it simple. Like if you were in a sort of what they call a nuclear family with a 
father and a mother and the children and et cetera. And, and, and suppose trouble was on its way. You see trouble coming, right? All, all you and your two and a half children, and, and you see trouble coming, and the father jets out and runs away. <laughs> and the people are like, the, 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 the wife is like, what kind of man did I marry? And the children are like, Avi or daddy, where, where, where are you going? And all he's thinking of is saving himself. This is the picture Mashiach is making. He's saying that I'm the good shepherd, that I'm willing to go out in front of y'all. I'm willing to make sure that you all are safe because, after all, I'm invincible. So if you would stay behind me, I will be your shield. I will be your buckler. Hallelujah. And I will be your source, and I will make sure that you get everything that you need. But if you are so used to your leadership running away from you, leaving you on your own, then it's probably hard to hear that. So all of y'all who come from broken families where there were divorces, where the husband was gone, the wife was gone, and the children were split up, where all of these things, what do they tend to do? They tend to remind us of what the enemy wants us to know. They, they tend to make us think that what's the point in honoring your father and your mother because, you know what, they're, they're just, you know, whatever they are, I got to do this on my own. And maybe, maybe you don't understand that, that you who, who are out there who maybe are in a tough spot with your family and maybe, and maybe you feel overwhelmed because of some of the things that are going on in your mind that remember earlier that you're not talking to anybody about except for the most high maybe and maybe not even him. And, 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 and you're thinking maybe there's a, a, a relief for you and the relief that you're thinking of is natural, is fleshy, is devilish, is sinful because you need to seek Elohim and you need to let his strength manifest in the midst of your life so that your family will be secure because any other security is far, F-A-U-X, security. And we don't want any parts of that because living in a delusion is what somebody else was apportioned for. We were apportioned to live in the truth. Hallelujah. Now, the, the high, did I finish that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches <coughs> the sheep and scatters them. Now, the hireling flees because he's in hireling and not concerned about the sheep. But he goes on to say that I'm the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me, and even as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. So that verse 14, again, reminds me of Yohanan 17, which maybe one day I'll just read really slow online so, so that, so that Haruah can just, just pour out of me all of the beauty that I see in that chapter. Maybe we'll get there. All right. So back to this idea of abundant life. Believe it or not, this good news was the basis, the same good news that Mashiach just relayed to the people listening to him in Israel is the same good news that comes out of Devarim 28, of the Devarim 28 promise as well. It was never meant that Israelites or those joined into them were to achieve all these blessings with willpower and good intentions. In other words, working like a dog was not the key to the blessings of Devarim 28. Devarim 28 was meant for people who loved Yah and who obeyed his commandments, and then he gave them this stuff. Let's read the second part of the slide. Let us not forget that the hearts of men were continually evil. Evil. We always needed Yah. Even in the garden, we needed him. He has manifested himself in Yahusha, the image of the invisible El. Hallelujah. And so <clears throat> I don't know if y'all remember, but I got one more uh, 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 installment of Ruach and Ahmed or Spirit and Truth. And that passage there about the image of the invisible L is going to be all over that. It's still coming. I know y'all y'all waiting and you're thinking, that frame forgot about it. But I'm working on it because I, I just keep getting more and more, and I just want to make it right. I want the Most High to be in the midst of it so that when you all hear it, that it blesses your life at the maximum level possible. Hallelujah. So 
Did I say this already? I'm going to say it again. It was never meant for us to just work, work, work in order to achieve those blessings from Devarim 28. It was meant for us to work. I'll take one work instead of the three. And that work was unto Elohim, and Elohim is the one that supplied the increase. Even, even, even the tithing rules, right? So it says the increase. And so where did this increase come from? It came from Yahuwah. You can't make your sheep multiply. Remember Yaakov when he was working for Laban? And, and, and so, you know, he, Yahuwah spoke to him and told him to do such and such and such and such. And he brought forth these speckled and these dotted sheep and et cetera. And that was his portion. My point is you didn't see him make the sheep do anything. It was Elohim and the wisdom from Shamaim that brought forth the increase. And that's how we want to get it. And once you do that, once you get it, and you get it, and you get it, and you train yourself to get it, then you are going to find yourself in shalom and not in turmoil. You're going to find yourself at peace and not in worry. All right. So what is your life? <laughs> what your life is like, I'm sorry. What your life is like. Okay, what my life is like, too. So, so, so I'm claiming two lives here, and one is from the Most High. And it's not the one I'm about to talk about. But my life and your life, this is what it's like. Job chapter 14. He comes forth like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Tehillim 103 and 15. A man's days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. But you know what happens to grass. And you know what happens to flowers. Let's put it in perspective. Kepha quotes out of Yeshayahu. Uh, and so we're going to ramp up a little bit to where that passage is at. So this is in 1 Kepha, 1 Peter uh, chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 22. And I say Kepha really packs it in. <clears throat> and that's because there's a lot that he says here. Um, excuse me. So it's also a good one to go back and, 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 and read um, the beginning part of it. But he says down in verse 22, Now that you've cleansed your lives in obeying the truth through the Spirit, to unfeigned brotherly love, excuse me, <coughs> through unfeigned brotherly love. Oh, my goodness. So you remember earlier that I said this thing about having these thoughts and about being alone and not having folk that you're really intimate with that you could kind of go there with and they're suffering from the same thing that you are and y'all right next to each other but y'all can't solve the problem because of fear because if I told you the stuff that was really in my head I'm thinking you might not want to have anything to do with me anymore or you might not know what to say or something negative instead of perhaps Elohim has got an answer to my problem in you. And perhaps he's got an answer to your problem in me. And so why I think about that is because, you know, Kepha makes this statement starting out here with, with you know, unfeigned brotherly love. That, what, what that unfeigned means is like not fake brotherly love, but real brotherly love. So, so, so there's a passage in, I guess it's in Mishli. It says th there's a friend that sticks closer to, than, to a, than, a, than a brother. And so this idea of, of brotherly love, uh, philo love, it, it's, it's, it's another level of covenant winding in together that this world and the enemy and even our flesh doesn't really promote, but the spirit, and that's why he said it, obeying truth through the spirit to unflame love. The spirit always wants to get us there. Love one another fervently with a clean heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. And so that's the two lives, right? We've got this corruptible life, then we've got this incorruptible life through 
the living word of Elohim. And so people think that that's talking about the letters on the, on the, on the scrolls. And I guess that's right to some extent. But the living word of Elohim is Yahusha, which remains forever. Because all flesh is as grass. All flesh is as grass. And all the esteem of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away. But the word of Elohim remains forever. That's a quote directly from Yeshayahu, uh, chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. And this is the word announced as good news to you. So Kepha is putting in perspective something that you all hear me do a lot, which is put in, trying to put in perspective this idea of the flesh and the spirit. Let's go on. <clears throat> when we see the word flesh in the scriptures, we often look at the meat that is on our bones or the body. That's normal, right? Well, this is a start. There's something more to the flesh. It has a will of its own, much like yeast in your belly that sends signals to your brain in order to manipulate your diet in a way that nourishes it. Now, some of y'all probably never heard of this, but many of you have. Inside your belly, these bacteria that are in there, they're, they're capable of sending signals to your brain that tells your brain to feed them. It's the reason why we end up in these sickly diets because our body is being hijacked. Because parasites are, are, are causing us to, to, um, to, to feed them instead of feeding us. All right. So if left unchecked, these, these signals should have been an S there would nourish the parasite and kill the host. That's how, that's how our flesh is. And again, I'm not limiting it to just our body, our natural body. There seems to be some kind of force at play. There seems to be something that's, that's, that's got a life of its own. And it will, it will nourish itself. In other words, eat more, uh, do wickedness as long as it makes you feel pretty good and at the same time kill you. So it says in Galatians, and I say, walk in the spirit that you, and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other. These are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you desire to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under Torah. So you see, Shaul understood how our flesh is like, it's like working against us. It's like, it's like that stuff in your belly that's saying, give me more sugar. Give me more sugar. Anybody? Anybody? Give me more sugar. Right? And, and sugar will rot in your teeth. It'll, it'll, it'll poison you. It'll cause excess calories. It is all kinds. It's an addiction. And so if we're not careful, we can turn those things that suppose, because suppose, it's nice to get something that's sweet every now and then. I like fruit. Maybe you don't. And fruit has got a sweetness to it, and I, I love it. But, 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 but what our flesh tends to do is to idolize those worldly sweetnesses like, you know, bigger cars, bigger houses, bigger planes, bigger whatever, whatever, which by themselves is nothing wrong with. But when those signals are being sent to you through your flesh and you're chasing after it like a person eating improperly due to the signals from his belly, then you're going to find that you're going further and further and further away from Elohim. And you might have what looks like the blessings to show for it, but those blessings are distracted or disconnected from obedience to the voice of Elohim. And sooner or later, like that flower we talked about earlier, they'll fade away. Because Yahuwah is replenishing the blessings that he's given. Because they actually come from him. So the works of the flesh are well known, which are these adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency, some, uh, oh, I don't know, 
I guess that's a comment on the scriptures version. Manuscripts omit adultery, idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, quarrels, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions. I meant to highlight that one. Dissensions, factions, envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the likes of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, that those who practice such shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. In other words, these things will kill you. So why did I mean to, 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 to do the selfish ambitions? Because it's a little trickier than the rest of them. Nobody listening to this message is like trying to be an adulterer. Nobody listening to this message is whoring around. Nobody listening to this message is, is thinking, I should just do unclean and indecent stuff. But this one, selfish ambitions, is tricky because if I just put my hand over selfish, it just says ambitions. And so who wants their daughter to marry a man who has no ambition? She's going to be taking care of him. Is that what we want our grandchildren to come from? No. Yah forbid. But selfish ambitions are those ambitions that are only, Yaakov says it best. He says you ask, but you ask amiss, that you may, that you may use it improperly. Can, can somebody find that verse for me? Um, I think it's important that I read it just right. So, so. Jacob, when he talks about uh, lust and, well, I'm going to find it. Give me just a second. Some of y'all know where it is. Y'all could type it in. Y'all could probably type it in faster than I can find it, but just in case, I'm going to keep looking. You know, it's really funny how when you're looking for something, you can't find it quickly because you're trying to find it quickly. And I guess nobody else is um, nobody else has found it. But I'm going to give it just another try. James four and three. How about James four and three? James four and three. James four and three. Yeah, ta-da! Hallelujah! Okay, what is the let's start, start in one. James, or Yaakov chapter 4, verse 1. Where do fightings and strivings come from among you? Do they not come from your pleasures that battle in your members? So there we go again. You desire and, 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 and do not have. You murder and are jealous and, 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 are unable to, and are unable to obtain. In other words, we, we want those Deborah 28 blessings but you're not able to attain them you strive and fight and you do not possess because you do not ask because you got to ask if you if you're asking then you're drawing near to the most high it's not just like throw it up you know Elohim give me this or you know give me that give me that it's like you draw near to him and it's like a child you know who, who comes to his ema and, and wants to uh, uh, drink some milk he can't get that from across the street he's got to get close to her and so you ask and do not receive because you ask evilly in order to spend it on your pleasures. And so let's try the, the, the King James version of that one too. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. In, order, in other words, inordinate desires. And so, and so that's where that idea of selfish ambitions comes from. It's not wrong to have ambition, but selfish ambitions will actually lead you to the gates of, Sh of Sheol. And this is what Sheol is saying. And it's not so, so apparent, and I don't think I've actually heard people talk about it a lot when we read through Galatians chapter 5, but there you have it. All right. And so, <coughs> finally, we find in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, Shaul makes this statement that I believe is a really good uh, 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 rememory verse, a really good 
prayer, uh, point of prayer for us. So listen up. He says, I rejoice in you who are greatly now that your last concern for me has revived again. He's talking to the Philippian assembly um, because backdrop, backdrop. The Philippian assembly supported Shaul financially. They, they gave him when nobody else did. I mean, he's going to Corinth and doing this, that, and the other, but they, they really took good care of him. And um, this is his, he's, he, this is the framework to understand what he's saying to them here. And I rejoice in Yahuwah greatly now that you're, at last your concern for me has revived again, uh, though you were concerned but had no chance. Not that I speak concerning need, for I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm, I am. So let's meditate on that for a minute. I learned to be content in whatever state I am. So, so, so for me, that, that, that just threw some water on the fires of selfish ambitions. It just, it just put some things in perspective for me. It's like, hold up, hold up. Remember, Ephraim, you've got eternal life in Messiah Yahusha. What, what could you be striving for? Remember, it's super abundant. It's, it's beyond. It's, it's extreme. It's, 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 it's like unmatched. And so what, what else could I really, like, got to have? You know, what's that, that saying, you know, what do you get for the person who's got everything? What do you get for the person who's got eternal life? What, what are they in need of? The truth of the matter is that when, when that person who's in eternal life, who's got Messiah, Yahusha, and, and they got this incorruptible seed from the Most High, and they've got intimacy with the Most High, and finally, one day, the flesh of their body dies just like it's going to do, just like it was meant to do. They, 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 they hardly lost anything. They lost connection with their loved ones, no doubt. But they hardly lost anything because the super abundant life that they have, whatever version of what happens when you die, you believe, at some point, that everlasting life is still there for them. So I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I know that it is, know what it is to be humbled, and I know what it is to have an excess. In any and every situation, I've learned both to be filled and to be hungry, both to have an excess and to be in need. I have strength to do all through Messiah who empowers me, yet you did well in sharing in my pressure. Those last two sentences, you know, I hear, you know, I could do all things in Messiah who strengthens me. I could do all things. Who, and so, and so, and so, and so slow it down. In context, what Shaul was not saying is that I could just do anything in Messiah. <laughs> because anything might not be legal and anything might not be expedient. But what he's talking about is this ability to remember that you've got so much in eternal life to where you're not wanting a lacking of any good thing. I, I, I believe it's, it, I don't feel uncomfortable saying that the Most High provided through Shaul, through the Philippian assembly. The Most High applied for me through, through whatever means he did. The Most High supplied your need through whatever means he did for you too. And, and so, so often our sight is short and we're looking like this and the Yahuwah is there. He's like, he sent them. When we get that Yahuwah-centric life and our, our thoughts and our patterns of understanding are all, all, all bound up in him, then that's when that's when that shalom, it really kicks in the overdrive. All right, so that's, that's uh, oh, this is the last slide, actually. All, all the <coughs> blessings of the Torah and whatever Yahuwah has spoken into your life. I notice I put that there because I believe that the Most High said things to you that he didn't write in the book because he certainly said things to me that he didn't write in the book. Maybe not in type, 
but specific things that he's spoken to me and that he's spoken to you, that he's going to speak to you. All those blessings are not the goal set apart ones. <laughs> it's not our target. Our target is, is they're, they're the, let me go. Our target is fellowship with him and with each other. Our target is to, is to love Yahuwah with our whole heart, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. Our target is to be able to actually walk out this Torah that he's given us, both written and spoken, so that, so that we find ourselves not just in him, but knowing we're in him, in agreement with it. And then, hallelujah, what happens is, is that these things are byproducts. It's, it's, like, it's like going outside in the rain, you get wet. Building your relationship with Elohim, you get blessed. You don't do the relationship with your wife because just because you want certain things from her. You do it because you love her. You don't deal with your husband and, and your children in a loving manner because you just want them to be this, that, or the other. That's manipulation. That's transactional. And we're, if you have a transactional relationship with Elohim, then you need to repent and you need to get to know him and you need to draw near to him that he draw near to you and then you're going to find out. I need to say that right because I don't like the fact that I was going to say and then you'll get blessed because then some people will walk away and say, ooh, I want that blessing so I better seek him. No, you seek him, seek him, seek him, seek him. And whether you're abased or whether you're abound, it's a blessing. But the chances are, is that that blessing, that Deborah, your version of Deborah 28, 1 through 14, is waiting around the corner when you repent and you seek Elohim with your whole heart. I'll read back from the slide. They are byproducts of the relationship that you have with the Eternal One. We must be diligent not to worship the created but the creator. Do not confuse Elohim likeness with great gain. In other words, just because people get stuff doesn't mean that they're good, they're, they're straight with the most high. But to seek him with our whole hearts and be thankful that we have an Elohim that is mindful of our state. And that's the last slide. So I don't know if there are any questions out there, uh, anything that I need to address or uh, answer. And so I just want to bless you all for uh, participating in this live stream. And I have to take it and, 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 and massage it and edit it and put it back into YouTube. But uh, I'm going to close with saying, Baruch Atah Yahuwah, blessed be your name. Torah Abba for your word and for the, the spirit of your word to, to reach the people wherever they are, Abba, even here in our home. And, and, and Abba, I pray that you would, you would, you would give us that desire to love you, Abba, because I don't know if anything comes on our own. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked, Abba. So I'm asking that you would help us to, to fall in love with you in such a way that, that, that it wouldn't matter if we ever got a natural blessing as long as we had you. And I thank you for that, Abba. Hallelujah and, and amen. Amen. All right, so there was something I wanted to, oh, hey. If, you, if, you, if you've been enjoying our videos, subscribe so that you can get noticed. We're going to be doing more videos uh, that are actually live streams in the future. And uh, I don't want you to miss them. If you um, like them, tell somebody about them. And um, we'll see you in the next video. Hallelujah.